Good morning. Welcome you to worship this morning at Emmanuel. Today is our second Sunday after Pentecost. This morning we are studying uh, again from our favorite book of the Bible, Romans chapter 8, also uh, passages from 2 Corinthians. Uh, we, can find, we can be confident that God will not waste what we're going through in life. He uses our past experiences to prepare us for future opportunities. And this truth can be especially comforting uh, when we encounter problems and challenges and difficulties in life that are certainly unavoidable in our daily routine. But God uses those for our, uh, to our favor and for good things. A couple of announcements, and then I have some other thing, prayer, a lot of prayer concerns I wanted to share with you. Again, uh, manual members are invited to participate in the Faith Fourth of July chorus. I think we have about, what, six or so members that are maybe participating the, in that. Practices are held on Sunday afternoons. They're always at 3 o'clock on Sunday afternoons, and they're at Faith Baptist Church. Registration forms are at the back of the church on that pew that is at the directly at the back. They're on a long legal uh, sheet of paper. So registration forms are back there for you to pick up. Bible school will be the week of July 24th through the 28th. Next Sunday, of course, is Father's Day when we'll recognize and honor all of our fathers. We also gather to celebrate a baptism, and that will be Sawyer Lee Standish, baby boy of Kelly and Kendra Evan Standish. Um, so this will be a very important day in their lives as well as in the lives of all fathers. So I hope you will plan to be present for next Sunday, Father's Day. Members of the Irene Beaver Circle will meet this coming Tuesday, and they're going to meet at a, mes a Mexican restaurant in Granite Quarry. Uh, the Judy Souls will meet on Thursday of this week at 11 o'clock, and that's going to be at the Stag and Doe uh, restaurant there in Chiney Grove. And try to arrive there uh, at least by about 10.50. They would not make reservations but I'm sure if everybody shows up there about the same time, they'll try to seat everybody together. The Judy Souls, of course, that's Emmanuel Seniors, and that was named after Judy Stiller. Yesterday was the two-year anniversary of Judy Stiller being killed. Two years it has been. We want to thank the Rockwell Civitan Club members as they cleaned up trash along Emmanuel Church Road yesterday morning. Uh, they always do a nice job and certainly make our road and our community look so much better. Um, you're invited, too, to attend the Rock in the Park Festival. That's going to be this coming Saturday. That will be at Rockwell Park starting at 11 o'clock, and it will end at about 7 p.m. There will be live bands and food trucks and uh, ben uh, other thing going on there as well uh, vendors will be there also with some selling things so it'll be a nice event for the community this coming saturday starts at 11 o'clock we want to congratulate kane leisure for earning several awards he was he's a student at rockwell christian school you can read more about that in the bulletin we want to congratulate also annabelle humes for receiving some award a special award for for uh during her uh, Dimensions Dance Art Recital. She was given an award because it it exhibits, uh, or she exhibits, uh, extreme dedication, commitment, and a passion for dance. And we're very proud um, of them, their accomplishments, uh, very proud as a, as a manual family of, of what they have accomplished. Prayer Concerns. Don Stywalt was taken to Rowan Regional Hospital on Friday a week ago. Not this past Friday, but a week ago. Uh, he had a place on his right leg. Uh, doctors thought it was an infection. He was at Rowan Regional. 
and they did a lot of tests. They put him on some antibiotics, and he went home on Monday, uh, but was not a whole lot better, but things can progressively got worse, and I think it was on Wednesday then he went to Lexington Medical Center, and they did some testing as well and located the infection had actually come from a callus that was on the bottom of his foot had gotten infected and that callus the infection moved from his bottom of his foot to little a little toe and then from there it went to his foot overall and from there it went up to his knee and even beyond the knee so his whole leg was infected um they did surgery then on friday to clean out some of that infection and he's doing some better. I talked to Don this morning, and his knee is really, in, he's in a lot of pain. He has a lot of knee pain uh, because of the infection. And he will probably be there at least uh, four or five more days. When he comes home, he will, of course, be on antibiotics as well. So keep him in your prayers, Stella as well, and Rhonda, and others in their family. Um, when one is like that out of the family in the hospital it makes things even harder for those that are left at home and Rhonda can be a testimony to that and I can be as well um, so keep Don and Stella and all the family members in your prayers Taylor Trexler is going to be having some surgery I believe that's this coming Friday I believe um, that's going to be on June the 16th at a place in Charlotte I believe it was South Park Medical or somewhere is that right? Good. Okay, South Park Medical in Charlotte. She's going to have some ear surgery on her right ear, I believe it is. Bonnie Cornelius, she recently had a knee replacement. She was at therapy on Monday of this past week and had some chest pains and some sweating, and they recommended uh, from, from her therapy place that she go to the hospital and get that checked out. She did. After hours being in the ER room, they re revealed that they did a lot of tests and scans, but it revealed that she had some small blood clots in both of her lungs, and they gave her heparin to dissolve that. She was in the hospital until Wednesday. She came home on Wednesday and doing some, some better. Mike Walls, we're glad to say, is here today. He came home from Northeast Medical Center about noon, I believe it was, on Monday. Um, he had been at the hospital for some eight days. Um, he came home tired and weak and still had some swelling in his foot and in his leg. Uh, he went to see the surgeon then on Wednesday, and they took one of the tubes out of his leg. He had three, took one out. He's left with two. There's one main tube there, and I think they plan to, uh, he plans to go back on June the 19th, and possibly they'll remove uh, that tube as well, or those tubes as well, if all goes well. Uh, on Friday, then, he went to his, his doctor's cancer doctor uh, to talk about treatments. And, of course, we know that no more chemotherapy. That's off the table. Um, but in three weeks, they might start something called MU. Therapy, immunotherapy. Um, and I, if you've read up on that, and please do, I, I personally think that will be good for Mike. Um, they're going to wait till he gains his strength back some more. Uh, they want him to gain strength in his immune system as well, get stronger, um, be able to re fight resistance and that sort of thing. Um, and so they're probably not going to start the immunotherapy until what three weeks from now three or four weeks they'll they'll let his body build back up somewhat from that um i believe mike and connie's gonna plan to travel a little bit this coming week eight o'clock in the morning very good mike our prayers go with you hope that works out well for you to be able to travel and um yeah that's pretty good glad to see you here today yep Hugh Balst, he continues to recover from having a mass removed it that was in his brain. Um, he is doing very well. He's taking IV antibiotics three times a day at home. He went to see his uh, radio um, doctor, cancer doctor too, radiology doctor, and that was on, I think that was on Friday or Thursday. Um, 
and he's going to be doing 30 radiation treatments uh, over a period, that's five a, a week, five a week, so that's a period of six weeks he'll be taking radiation. Along with that, he'll be taking a chemotherapy pill. Um, so radiation and a chemotherapy pill. And that's going to wait and start in several weeks. They again are wanting him to get his body and strength built back up as well. He will be taking the treatments. He will be taking the treatments in Salisbury. In Salisbury. The radiation treatments in Salisbury. Bryson Lomax, he's our one-year-old baby that we have been praying for. He has had many health issues since birth. I could not attempt to list all of the issues that he has had since birth. Um, he has one kidney. His left leg is shorter than his right. His femur is just a nub. Uh, he had a hole in his heart. Uh, I think when he was born, but more than that, a lot of kids are born with, uh, babies are born with a hole in their heart, but he was classified as a blue baby. Blue babies is what he had, which uh, required open heart surgery at about age of uh, six months old. And what that means is, as I understand it in, in lay terms, is that uh, you have uh, valves both of his, or two of his valves were coming out of his right um, side of his heart, right ventricle of the heart. And that's one should be coming out the left and one out the right side of the heart. I believe I'm right. Anyway, that had to be corrected. And one was real small. One hole, I think, was real small, and it should not have been. In other words, he was not getting enough blood, I believe, to his lungs, if I'm correct on that um so that was that had to be corrected at six months old most recently though uh things have looked a little bit better kidney functions are good kidney numbers are good he's off of sedation drips um he may need a something that they call a j-tube that will require surgery um his organs when he was born was not functioning properly maybe not even in the proper place so to speak so they've tried to rearrange those organs and put them back in at the proper placement but that has produced problems so this j-tube surgery will help bypass the stomach or some of the intestines and so forth so that's pretty serious surgery they're trying to hold off on that that may be this coming week as of this morning or yesterday, he was running a fever again, 101.1 or 2. He's running a fever, and some other issues have come up. So it seems like they are able to celebrate a day or two, but then other health issues seem to come into play for this young baby. Um, so certainly keep him in your prayers. Um, he has been more alert and more awake in recent days. Uh, in fact, parents say now when they leave, he cries, they can see tears that come around and form at his breathing tube. So he does show some emotion when the parents do leave. Um, parents are asking you for your prayers. In fact, friend is here today, friend Pepper, and she's good friends of the family. Uh, she would like to say a few words, and, and, and I think she's going to read to you uh, how meaningful it is for your prayers to be offered for Bryson. Bryson Lomax is who we're praying for. Um, his mother put up, um, our, our perfect baby boy is the strongest human we have ever met. We know God has a plan for him, and it's not to stay in the hospital bed forever. We know that the... There are prayers coming from all over, and we appreciate them more than, you, than we could ever express. Thank you for all the prayers from everyone and everywhere. Thank you for continuing to fight for us, for our baby boy. Thank you for trusting God with us. We have genuinely felt the prayers because some days are just harder than others. We love you all. So I really do appreciate the fact that no one's ever met this little boy. In a year, he spent more time in the hospital than he has at home. 
but just thank you so much for the prayers. It means so much to the family because they have children at home. So like Pastor said, you know, they're trying to divide their time at the hospital and being home. But they just, the family just wanted everyone to know, thank you so much for all your prayers. It really means a lot. And I know it, they think about it often, how much can a little child stand? You know, how, how much can the child? But it seems like just when he gets at the lowest point, he rallies. Isn't that right, friend? Yeah. He, he rallies back. And uh, he, they call him a, a B warrior. Warrior B. Warrior B. Warrior B. Yeah, yeah, Warrior B. Well, you've got to you've got to be a fighter. You got to have, you got to be a warrior, and he certainly is. He's a fighter to come back, but he he's gone through a lot and continues. He's got he's got other bumps in the road. Seem like when there's a little clearance, then there's a couple other bumps that come along the way. So keep him in your prayers. Donna Petit, Donna Peeler, uh, Bill and Jerry Neal's daughter, I guess oldest daughter, Donna Petit was diagnosed with a large mass in her colon. Um, she also has some issues concerning her liver. Um, some of, uh, yeah, the cancer has spread, they think, to her liver. So keep Donna Petit in your prayers. Our prayers are with uh, the family members of Moses Deal. He was 44 years old and born to the parents of Terry Deal and uh, the late Diane Burleson Deal. He lived almost all of his life on Mount Hope Church Road. He had three brothers, Randy Steller, John Steller, and Jerry Steller. In his, in his earlier days, Moses played some softball, church softball with us. His mother, Diane, would bring him often with her to church, and he would travel with us on youth trips. As a young boy, he always remembered riding in the church van he always that was a memorable moment for him was was for me too um and during the summers he loved going to church camp at luther ridge experiences that he never forgot there when diane was not able to drive herself then to church uh we know that moses was willing to drive her here and i still have pictures of moses helping diane all the way through the sidewalks and into the side door and then they would come and sit in the author Shipton room. So Moses was gladly helping her as she helped him to church earlier in life. He always enjoyed doing things with his son Israel, canoeing, exploring in the woods, working on his Volkswagens and building a clubhouse and fishing. And then he was diagnosed with lung cancer. Moses was in October of 2022 last year in the march of that year or, or march of this year he was diagnosed in october but then in march uh, he went to duke university to have that mass removed in his lung so they removed a large mass that was blocking 80 percent of his airway they removed that he came home recovered some from the surgery then in the month of april he took chemotherapy treatments and radiation treatments and later then, he went back for more scans in the hospital, and it revealed that he had uh, two, or th well, two spots on his brain. Moses appreciated our prayers. Uh, we, we, we know that. He spoke of that. He appreciated, uh, and he had made things right with his Lord uh, before he passed away. Um, he always said, or he, his answer was, that he was going to be all right. Whether he lived or whether he died, he knew he would be all right because he was in the Lord. And that's what we all, that's what our faith is all about. So he died then in the Lord on May the 4th. And his memorial service was held this past week on Thursday here at the church. It was at 4 o'clock. And family members were fed afterwards. So please keep Israel. That's his son, Amanda, bass singer and um, also his dad, uh, Terry, uh, Terry Deal, and, your, and other family members, all the brothers, um, John, Jerry, and, jo and Randy, in your prayers. The family members of Jerry Craig, now you probably do not know Jerry Craig, but 
Jerry and his wife Judy were close friends of my wife, Kim and all and Kim's parents, uh, Ruth and Calvin Ledbetter. Judy taught school at Bethlehem Elementary, where Kim's father was principal for many years. I guess she taught there for many years as well. Uh, and Jerry is her husband. And his memorial service is going to be held on this coming Wednesday, and that will be at 12 o'clock noon at St. Mark's Lutheran Church in Claremont, North Carolina. Yeah, okay, Jerry was a student of uh, Ruth and Calvin Ledbetter's, yeah. And uh, Jerry was 81 years old. And Judy was my sixth grade teacher. Judy was your sixth grade teacher, okay. <laughs> she gave, uh, Judy gave Kim a C in conduct, and I know she didn't deserve that, so. <laughs> no, there's been grudges, yeah. Yeah, grudges have been held for many, many years because of it. The family members of Hoppy Hopkins, especially his wife Vivian and uh, Ralph Udi, who was a brother-in-law, he and his wife Vivian were co-owners of the Fifth String and, and Company. That's a music store catering to bluegrass and to the traditional music industry. His funeral service is going to be held this also on Wednesday at 2 o'clock p.m., and that will be at Gold Hill Methodist Church. Visitation will be prior to that, I think, from 1 o'clock to 1.45. Again, visitation will be at the church as well. Um, and we remember the family members of Matthew King, especially his mother, Kathleen, especially his brother, Chandler King, and a memorial service will be held at a later date for them. And we remember the family members of Eva Millsap. She died this morning. She was in hospice at Kannapolis, and I believe she died from brain cancer. Do we have other announcements this morning? Yes, Tracy. You can get someone hand you want hand him a microphone. Yeah, it'll come through on YouTube much, much better. Well, I'm not too good at writing thank you notes, but, you know, two months ago our world was kind of turned upside down. And uh, I'm just coming up here to say how thankful and grateful we are for a congregation and support group like we have here in Emmanuel. I mean, it's been overwhelming at what the community and the circles and the people of this church did for me and my family, you know. And my own extended, my own family at home, you know, we did this past week, we got started something back, and I couldn't have done that without the support and help of the people in here and the whole community as a whole. And I just want to say how thankful we are to have friends just like the people that are sitting out here. This may not be the biggest congregation. It is. But I can tell you one thing. It's one of the strongest it is when it comes to something like this. And I just want you to know how appreciative we are for what we have here. Thank you very much. You're most welcome. God bless you. Yeah, we can give that back. I'll give it back to Christy. Yeah, yeah. Just give him a hand. I think they've gotten the old torn down and you're going up with some new stuff. Is that correct, Tracy? Sherry? Yeah, okay. New stuff's going up. Very nice. That's wonderful. Wonderful. Any other announcements this morning? Keep these folks in your prayers. We certainly, uh, people need them and they appreciate them. And you don't know how much it means to people, uh, your prayers and your thoughts. We're ready for our prelude this morning. Dr. Rob and Dana are away. And uh, of course, this is a good time that we can meditate and pray as well. And Nathan's going to be in charge of that today for us. So. Nathan, we appreciate you today. Uh, are you gonna Are you gonna sw Are you gonna sway too? Yeah. Okay. Okay. He's 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 got this down. I'm telling you, he's been practicing. Listen, listen to this. Listen.
we stand for our call to worship. Call us in often and teach us to old words and old songs with their new meanings. Lord, give us new words for the words we wear out. Give us new songs for those that have lost their spirit. Give us new reasons for coming in and for going out into our streets and to our homes. As the house of the Lord once moved like a tent through the wilderness, so keep our churches from being rigid. Make our congregation alive and free so that alleluia and gloria and amen are like new experiences we know in daily living. Alleluia. O oh Lord, be praised. In worship, worship and love, be praise. Amen. Nathan, turn the volume up a little. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart 
We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, judge of us all, you have placed in our hands the wealth we call our own. Give us such wisdom by your spirit that our possessions may not be a curse in our lives, but an instrument for blessing. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God has made us his people through our baptism into Christ, living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Lord God of all nations, you have revealed your will to your people and promised your help to us all. Help us to hear and do what you command, that the darkness may be overcome by the power of your light, through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Old Testament lesson is from 2 Samuel, the 23rd chapter. Benaniah, son of Jehoiada from Kazil. Hey, Nathan, those are some good words and good names that you and Dominique can think of for your children. How's that? Okay. See in conduct. Anyway, was another famous soldier. He did many brave deeds, including killing two great Moabite warriors. He once went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. And the epistle lessons begin with Romans 8. So then, my friends, we have an obligation, but it's not to live as our human nature wants us to. For if you live according to your human nature, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death your sinful actions, you will live. Those who are led by God's Spirit are God's children. For the Spirit that God has given you does not make you slaves and cause you to be afraid. Instead, the Spirit makes you God's children, and the Spirit's power we cry out to God, Father, my Father. God's Spirit joins himself to our spirits to declare that we are God's children. Since we are his children, we will possess the blessings he keeps for his people, and we will also possess with Christ what God has kept for him. For if we share Christ's suffering, we will also share his glory. In the same way, the Spirit also comes to help us, weak as we are. For we do not know how we ought to pray. The Spirit himself pleads with God for us in groans that words cannot express. And God who sees into our hearts knows what the thought of the Spirit is, because the Spirit pleads with God on behalf of his people and in accordance with his will. We know that in all things God works for good with those who love him, those whom he has called according to his purpose. Those whom God had already chosen, he also set apart to become like his son, so that the son would be the first among many believers. And so those whom God set apart, he called. And those he called, he put right with himself, and he shared his glory with them. In view of all this, what can we say? If God is for us, who can be against us? Certainly not God, who did not even keep back his own son, but offered him for us all. He gave us his son. Will he not also freely give us all things? Who we will accuse God's chosen people. God himself declares them not guilty. Who then will condemn them? Not Christ Jesus who died, or rather who was raised to life, and is at the right side of God 
pleading with him for us. Who then can separate us from the love of Christ? Can trouble do it, or hardship, or persecution, or hunger, or poverty, or danger, or death? As the scripture says, for your sake we are in danger of death at all times. We are treated like sheep that are going to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we have complete victory through him who loved us. For I am certain that nothing can separate us from his love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor other heavenly rulers or powers, neither the present nor the future, neither the world above nor the world below. There is nothing in all creation that will ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which is ours through Christ Jesus our Lord. And from the eighth chapter of Second Corinthians. Are they Christ's servants? I sound like a madman, but I'm a better servant than they are. I have worked much harder. I have been in prison more times. I have been whipped much more, and I have been near death more often. Five times I was given the 39 lashes by the Jews. Three times I was whipped by the Romans, and once I was stoned. I have been in three shipwrecks, and once I spent 24 hours in the water. In my many travels, I have been in danger from floods and from robbers, in danger from my own people and from Gentiles. There have been dangers in the cities, dangers in the wild, dangers on the high seas, and dangers from false friends. There has been work and toil. Often I have gone without sleep. I have been hungry and thirsty. I have often been without enough food, shelter, or clothing. And not to mention other things, every day I am under the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Here ends the lessons. We invite the children to come forward for the children's sermon. Sometimes our, our lives seem a little bit useful and broken, um, but the scripture that we read from Romans uh, reminds us that all things work together for good to those people that love the Lord. All things work together for good. Such a wonderful passage that we have from Romans chapter 8, verse 28, Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good. That doesn't mean all things are good, but God's going to work all things together and, and they'll turn out to be good. I heard a story about a teenager and he had a dream. Um, this, this young teenager boy, um, he had a dream that he was going to be, uh, in fact, that, that coming year, he was going to be in a, a skateboarding tournament. He was great on a skateboard. Do you, any of y'all do any skateboarding? Have you ever tried that? You know what a skateboard, you know, it's got rollers on the bottom of it. Have you ever tried that? Pretty hard to do. You've got to have a lot of balance and skill to do that. But he was really good at it. But uh, he took a nasty fall just prior to this tournament that was going to take place and really got hurt bad. Um, he managed to get his way back to the house, back to his home where his parents were, and uh, his parents rushed him to the hospital. In fact, they took him by ambulance there. And doctors told 
the parents that he might have a paralysis. He might be paralyzed. His name is Judith Martin. This is a true story. And Judith practiced constantly on his skateboard. He, 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 just, he just knew that one day he would be a pro at it. He would go pro with skateboarding. And, but his parents now feared that this, his dream would be shattered. He, he wouldn't probably ever be able to do that again. He had no feeling on his left side on his left arm or his left leg as he was approaching the hospital. In fact, his head was just sort of flopping all around as his parents was there. His dad went into the room to sort of hold up his head. He couldn't even hold his head up. And as his dad was holding his head, uh, his dad prayed over him. And, his, and, and the boy opened, uh, Judah opened his eyes and said, Dad, God's going to heal me. Dad, God's going to heal me. Well, at that moment, faith sort of shot through his dad. Uh, they were at the King's Daughters Hospital. That's in Virginia, Norfolk, Virginia is where they were at. And the neurosurgeon came in and immediately did an MRI, like a scan, and it revealed that there was a spot on his brain, on Judah's brain. And uh, scans revealed also that the tendons that were connecting his uh, spine to his spine, they were uh, completely broken, shevered. Uh, uh, so he very well could be paralyzed. Uh, so it looked like his life was broken, but his mother, uh, she at that particular moment said that she felt the power of the Holy Spirit come into her life at that moment. And the Spirit sort of asked her, do you still believe that God is good? Do you still believe that God is good? You know, it's easy. It's easy for us to think God is good when everything's going great, isn't it? But when things don't go great, when we're in trouble and difficult times come, sometimes then it tests our, it tests our faith. And, and so the, the Holy Spirit was asking her, do you still believe that God is good? And she became so, so completely convinced that God was good, not even knowing what they were going to see, what they were going to feel, what, they were going to, what the test results were going to be. She still felt that God is good. She had that confidence. Now that night, his dad stayed with him in the hospital. They had other children. So mom went home. The dad stayed in the hospital. And about 3 o'clock in the morning, his dad decided that he would, he would take his phone out and that he would take a picture of, Ju of his son, Judah, that was laying there. So he got his phone out and took a picture of him. And, and that was 3 o'clock in the morning. Took a picture and put it on Facebook, put it on out there on the Internet, and it went viral. He told the story about how his son had gotten hurt on the skateboard, and it went viral. It went around the world. And people began praying for his son all over the world. They sent text messages back in. And the next morning, when the doctors came in with the test results, Judah had suffered from a near-fatal concussion. That's what the places were on his brain that they had noticed, those spots on his brain. But when doctors came in, they said, you know what? We don't know. We don't know what happened. But that spot in his brain is gone gone completely gone of course his family was excited about that they were jumping for joy they were crying of emotion and after eight weeks of rehabilitation that he went to in prayers he went back to the doctors and they did more scans they did more x-rays on his neck and on his head and they could not find any signs of anything that had ever happened now, only God could do that. And for Judah, he, he is back doing what he loves. He's back on his skateboard. Uh, and he gives God all the praise and glory because he knows that God did it. And he's able to live a normal life to this very day. And because of that, he shares what God did with other boys and girls as well. He's glad to share that with other people so that he will help bring others 
to know of the love of Christ and of Christ's healing power. So immediately after his accident happened, though, I thought about that. You know, we have, we, we feel broken, you know, when things happen. Uh, you know, and I'm sure he felt like, uh, felt like maybe this piece of glass on this mirror that I have. Uh, broken pieces of glass, you know, they seem to be somewhat uh, worthless, don't they? And our lives sometimes feel that way. I think that one's going to fall off on the floor in just a minute. Uh, but they feel like bro our lives are broken a lot of times. And sometimes when we, when we look into the mirror, just a plain mirror, and when we look into the mirror ourselves, uh, when bad things have happened to us, we feel broken. Sometimes we feel mm, maybe useless. We don't feel like we used to be. And so a mirror is a good reflection of that, isn't it? Now, if you cut the lights out for us a little bit, can you dim the lights over there? But you know what? If you show a little light on things, hey, Sarah, turn on flashlight. Hmm, comes on. If you put a little light to something, can you see how pretty that looks with a little light put to it? From any angle you look at it, you're going to get different reflections of glass. And even if we put a light against a mirror, we get a lot of different reflections. I mean, it may reflect, but when you put it against a mirror, you know, put, people put mirrors in their homes because it will reflect different light. It'll make, it, it'll make the room a lot brighter. So the light makes, from a mirror, makes it look bright. That's the way our lives, I think, are. God, God can take the brokenness that we have. You can cut the lights back on now again, Christy and Kim. Um, but God can take the, the, uh, the brokenness of our lives that looks like it's nothing to it, and he can turn it in and make it into something really beautiful just like he did for this boy's life, uh, Judah's life. It looked like things were tragic for him, but God turned all that around and brought him a miracle, and he was able to go back skateboarding. I think of this wonderful little thing, and I know you know what it's called. What are these things called? Kaleidoscopes, right? You ever seen one of these little things that you look up into the bright light with and you turn them? can turn the things and it looks like really it's just broken pieces of can be glass or plastic or little figure things in there but when you turn it and you hold it to the light again you've got to have the light the light and that makes the brighter the light the, the more beautiful the designs are that's in the kaleidoscope these are wonderful things that one is is even different than that Yeah, let me see that one there with the other, other one there. This one is, is, is really neat because it's got these things that you slide in and out, and that's the part. And, it, and you see all the little crystal things in there? So you hold that up to the light, and you look through it, and you move these little things around and turn them and twirl them around, and you get all kind of neat little designs from that. So that is really a neat thing. Uh, really nice. Different kinds of kaleidoscopes. But they're neat because it's a good, it's a good thing. It, beautiful designs come from something that's broken. Broken glass, broken plastic. And someone came up with the idea to put that in behind a little plastic. You can make your own at home out of a, a toilet paper um, tube. And just with a few little things, you can put beads in that toilet paper tube. You can take a piece of tin foil, fold it three ways like that one that she has, fold it three ways like a little triangle, put that in the toilet paper tube with some beads, and then you've got to and close up the end with a little clear plastic and look up in the light, and you've got a kaleidoscope. You can do your own at home as well. So they're neat to do. Might not be something you could do at a restaurant. Well, if you took your own toilet paper roll, you could.
but, but, but you can do those things at home. Really nice to do. But God takes the brokenness of our lives that looks like it has no potential, that nothing's going to happen, and he takes that brokenness that we have in our life and he builds on it and makes something really beautiful out of it, like this work of, of uh, art from glass. You know, people do a lot of things. This is something new in this verse. It's right there in verse 14. If you're not led by the Spirit of God, you're not a child of God. But if you're led by the Spirit of God, you are a child of God. Now, we read that and we think, well, that's very simple. Very simply put, isn't it? To be led by the Spirit of God means exactly this. Your thoughts, that would be your mind. Your passions, that would be your heart. And then your actions, your body, your life. All of that is going to be led by the Spirit of God. You've got it then. You understand it then when you mind, thought, and your heart, all of that functions together. And as a result of that, then we move down, we skip down to Romans chapter 8, verse 28. So we go from verse 14 down to verse 28. Again, a very famous verse, a very important verse in the Bible. It's how we, and, and we certainly love that verse, and it's very logical. It's a logical verse. We are led by the Spirit of God. Therefore, when we're led by the Spirit of God, verse number 28, all things work together for good to those who love the Lord, and to those who are called according to his purpose. Now, we looked at that a little bit last Sunday, if you were here. Um, have you ever seen a watch, a watch that you wear on your arm, and on the back of that watch is clear plastic or maybe glass? Have you ever seen a watch like that that you could see the gears and the workings of the back of the watch? Ever seen that? Some of you have. Well, the first time I ever saw that, I was amazed at that watch, uh, amazed at the little workings in there, all the turnings and all the little wheels and the gears. Uh, one went this way and one went that way, and one seemed to go counterclockwise, one went clockwise, and I thought, what in the world is all that coming to be? I mean, how, how could all that function together? all those little different parts, all the wheels and all the different little pulleys. They were jumping up and down all those small parts. Uh, but I'll tell you what, what was happening there, it was causing all of that working together was causing you and I to be able to tell time. And that's an amazing thing that that could function like that, all those little different parts. And I thought about that when I think about this verse how that watch could come together and function together. And that's the way it is in our life. We, we watch all this work together things in our life. We know all things in life, that is the good and the bad and the ugly. It doesn't matter what we're going through in life. They're working together for good, for God's glory, as we seek to live out his purpose in our lives. All that's working together, all those little gears and pulleys and things. And now we come to where we left off last Sunday. And we say, well, what do we, do, what do we say to these things? What do we say about all of this? And you remember last Sunday we had a little give and take. You remember that? We had a little give and take. I said, if God be for us, and then the pulpit said, Side said, uh, who could be against us? And then this lectern side, which included the choir, the lectern side said, nobody. Remember? I said, if God be for us, who can be against us? Nobody. So let's try it. If God be for us, nobody. Very good. Let's try it again. I like it. If God be for us, Nobody, right. And you see, that's what Paul is doing here. He's warning us in a logical way, in a very practical way to understand this. Paul said, well, who can be against us? Obviously, nobody 
because God and through Jesus Christ has already given us his best offer to us. And that is his son was able to make everything right on the cross for us. Everything he made right. He gave us, Jesus Christ has already given us his best, his life itself. And therefore, if God be for us, well, this side's a little weak. <laughs> Did y'all hear them? No. We're gonna, I, let, let me get my hearing aids turned up. Okay. We're going to try it again. If God be for us, nobody. Very good. Let me cut my hearing aids back down. Uh, and then he says, who in the world can charge us with anything? The devil tries, doesn't he? The devil tries. Our conscience tries to. We worry about things. Uh, so our conscience, nobody can charge us when we're in the family of God. It says that God has justified us. In other words, we're like in a court of law, and we've been brought before the judge. We've been brought before the jury, we, and the judge says to us, you're free. You're justified. It's all over. Case is closed. You go. You've been justified. Nobody then can charge us with anything. Nothing in the past. No, no, no. Nothing in the past. It can't be done. And then he goes on to say, who in the world can condemn us? Nobody can condemn us. Because on the cross, Jesus Christ took your condemnation. He took my condemnation. And because of Easter and the resurrection, it verifies everything that Jesus did and everything that Jesus said. So that nails it down for us. We are not condemned through Jesus Christ. We are forgiven. And it's evidence in time and place in history through the resurrection and through Easter. And then we see where Jesus is now. Where is Jesus now? Where does this where does the apostle uh, of Creed say that Jesus is now? He's seated where? Right hand of God, isn't he? He's at the right hand of God. Now, that's amazing, interesting. In the temple, during those days, there were no seats. Did you know that? No, no seats in the temple. Um, in the temple they were, is where they offered all those sacrifices over and over again for hundreds of years and there was no place for people to sit in the temple. And you might ask, why? Why, did, why was there no seats in the temple? It was because the priests kept coming in and repeatedly offering sacrifices over and over again. There was sheep and goat and lambs and whatever. He offered those sacrifices for sin over and over again. But now we see that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God because the ultimate sacrifice has been made. Jesus is seated there with God. Sacrifice forever has been fully paid. Prior to that, there were no seats in the temple. We see another question asked in the scripture there. It says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And by the way, that who there needs to be a what. It can be a who or a what. Who separates us? What separates us from the love of Christ? So here we go again. I'm going to say, what can separate us from the love of Christ? And this side is going to say, nothing. Let's try it. One, two, three. What can separate us from the love of Christ? Nothing. And what can separate us from the love of Christ? Nothing. Who or what is nothing? Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. you got to get that nailed down in your life. It will mean so much to you when you go through challenges and troubles and calamity in life. you got to have that nailed down. Paul mentions it over and over again in the Scriptures. Some things 
that will separate us from the love of Christ, or they try to separate us. If you look at verse 35, he begins that list in Romans chapter 8. He talks off, starts off with trouble. Trouble tries to separate us from the love of Christ. And we know how true that is. It's a picture of pressure. We get in trouble. We get in pressure. No matter what it is, maybe something at the job, something at school, maybe it's a health problem, whatever it might be, we get under that pressure and we tend to think that separates us. The trouble gets exaggerated and trouble gets out of proportion. And then we begin to question in the midst of that trouble, does God really love me? Where is God in the midst of all this trouble? Where is God in the midst of all this pressure that I'm going through? Will that separate me from Christ? And then he mentions another one, hardship. That's when we get in a narrow place. Hardship is, is in this life that we live sometimes, and it's, it's like we're in a narrow little place, like in a narrow little elevator type thing. We're surrounded, a narrow room that we can't maneuver in, we can't get around in. The walls feel like it's closing in on us. That's, that's hardship. And, and somehow or other, when we're in the midst of that hardship, we feel as though somehow we're, we're not in the midst of the love of God. We feel like we're separated from the love of God, but we don't want to be. But the walls keep coming in. And then he mentions another word there, what persecution, doesn't he say? And that's prominent today if you're a Christian, persecution. About 600,000 Christians are martyred every year around the world for standing up for Christ. 600,000. And well, you say, well, that's not happening in America. Well, you just wait a little while. It's on its way and you can book it. You can write it down. The heat is going to be turned up on us in America, we see it coming because we see that in our world, it's headed in the wrong direction. So the heat is being turned up in our world, and it costs a little bit now for us to be a Christian. But I'll guarantee you, sometime, some years from now, it's going to cost a lot for us to be a Christian. Hunger, he mentions. Maybe ex we may experience food shortages. There we have it. There'll be famines. And hunger, and that means that we don't have enough to get along. And that tends to separate us. God, if you love us, provide food for us, nourishment, manna to eat, provide for us, Lord. So hunger tends to separate us from the love of God. He talks about danger, a lot of danger in the world. I saw a listing of the most dangerous cities to live in. Of course, there was Chicago, and there was Baltimore, and there was New Orleans, there was Houston, Texas. But the most dangerous city to live in America, for your information, is St. Louis, Missouri. St. Louis, Missouri. Most dangerous city in America. More dangerous than New York City. Mm. Now, you might ask, how does Paul know all of this? How can Paul be, uh, why could he write so authoritatively on the subject? What can separate us from the love of God? Boy, I caught you off guard on that one, didn't I? Nobody. Okay. What can separate us from the love of God? Nobody. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Look at Paul again in 2 Corinthians. He says it this way. Beautiful, beautiful. In chapter number 11, verse 23 and following. I have worked much harder. I have been in prison more times. I have been whipped much more. I have been near death more often. Five times I was given 39 lashes by the Jews. Three times I was whipped by the Romans. I once was stoned. I have been in three shipwrecks. And once I spent four, 24 hours in the water. In my many travels, I have been in danger from floods and from robbers and in danger of my own people and from Gentiles. There have been dangers in the cities, dangers in the wilds, dangers in the high seas, and dangers from false friends. And there has been work and toil. Often I have gone without sleep. I've, I've been hungry and thirsty. I've often been without enough food, shelter, or clothing. Verse 28, and not to mention other things, 
every day I am under the pressure of my concern for all the churches. And Paul would say, I know all of these things tend to separate us from the love of God. He went through all of those things. He, He had the experiences that we have and even maybe 10 times more because he went through all these things that have a tendency to separate us from the love of God. But he went through all of things. Why? Now, we have to get very practical here about it. And why does God's people, why does Paul, why does all of us go through all of these things? Why do we have to go through all these things? We ask that, don't we? Lord, why do we have to go through these trials and tribulations? You know why? It's so you and I will have a resume. A resume. A few years back, I bumped into a verse that's in 2 Samuel. We read it this morning. Chapter 23, beginning at verse 20. Benaniah, son of Jehovah from Kazil, was another famous soldier. In other words, we'll skip that. Benaniah was another famous soldier. He did many brave deeds, including killing two great Moabite warriors. Now listen to this. Benaniah once went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. Did everybody get that? He went down into a snowy pit, I mean on a snowy day, and killed a lion. Now, there's a lot of victors in the Bible. But this guy, Benaniah, let me tell you what he did. Evidently, there was a man-killing lion that was out on the loose. It was killing people. It was killing animals. And Benaniah was a lion hunter. He was a lion chaser. And it was a snowy day. And I'm sure that Benaniah had his club. I'm sure he had a knife with him that day. And I can just see him trying to find this killer lion. And suddenly he locks eyes on that lion. Their, their eyes meet each other. And the amazing thing is that Benaniah runs toward the lion and the lion runs away from him. And a lion, I looked up, can run about 35 miles an hour. It can jump 30 feet. And the average lion weighs about 500 pounds. And Ben and I begins to pursue the lion. Get the picture. Snow is falling. And so the lion is getting ahead of him. And the lion eventually, uh, he didn't know it, but he, he stumbled into a pit, the lion did, because of the snow on the ground. He went down into that pit, and he could, we, could, we can just see Ben and I. Now, he's in front of Ben and I. He's ahead, but... But Ben and I could see the lion fall, lion fall into that pit. So Ben and I goes up to that pit and he looks down in there and he thought about doing something, I'm sure. Uh, But he stood there for a little bit and thought about it. And he said, you know, I'm at the wrong place to, to kill this lion in the pit. It's the wrong time. It's snowing. It's slick and you can't see. So we see that Ben and I sort of backs away now from the pit and he turns away, stands there for a minute and then turns back around and goes back to the pit and does an amazing thing. He turns and he charges and he leaps into the pit on a snowy day. And amazingly, Ben and I came crawling out of that pit. Now, I'm sure he was bloody. I'm sure he had scratches and scrapes all over him. I'm sure the lion took a chunk out of his body, but he killed a lion in a pit on a snowy day. Now, you're saying, what's that got to do with anything? Well, it's all about the hardships that we go through. What, 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 what's that all about? What's, what's all the hardships we go through about? It's about building a resume. 
Later on, if you go back and you read some more in 2 Samuel, King David was looking some, for someone to be in charge of his bodyguards. And the most, that was one of the most important pit, uh, positions that the king could appoint was, was somebody to protect him. And all the threats that came to him, you remember all the threats that came to King David, you know, from his family, from his friends, from his enemies, from everybody. Everybody was against King David. And so King David took this position very seriously to appoint bodyguards. And this is what he was doing was he was looking for men that had important resumes. He was looking at the resumes of these men who would become, who would become uh, his bodyguards. So David probably looked down the list. Let's imagine what the list looked like. Oh, here's a guy. Well, he has his Ph.D. in martial arts from the University of Jerusalem. Well, that's good. That's good. The next guy, he looks at his resume, and he says, well, he is the undisputed cage champion of Israel. And David says, mm, that's good. You know, he's strong. He's stout. And he looks at the next guy, and he holds the record for uh, uh, weightlifting, for lifting the most weights in the history of the country. And David says, well, that's, that's impressive on your resume. He's a strong guy, can lift the most weights. But then he comes to this guy who it says on his resume, on a snowy day, he went down in the pit and killed a lion. And David said, I don't have to look anywhere else. I don't have to look anymore. I found my guy. It's Benaniah. Benaniah came down into that pit and he killed that lion and that built his resume and he got a very important position in the land because of this amazing moment because it had made him a hero. Benaniah. Now, what's the point of all this? Good question. Yeah. Albert asked that, didn't he? Let's see if we can bring it to a conclusion. I hear it's not as bad as you thought it was, is it? What's the point of all this? If anybody thinks that they're going to turn America around, if they're going to have their family come alive for God in Christ, if, if we're going to change the educational system, if we're going to heal our government, if we're going to uh, bring into the business world and fill it with integrity, if we're going to bring up children in a godly way in the 21st century, if anybody thinks that all of this is going to happen, let me tell you, it's probably not going to happen with Christians like mostly like we are. Calm, reflective, thoughtful, and defensive. You say, well, I want to be like Jesus. And you know how Jesus was? Other than what you learned about Jesus maybe in the first and second grade of Sunday school. Jesus was a lion chaser. That's who he was. We're going to have to become lion chasers like Ben and I was in order to use our calling, in order to use our ability, in order to use our influence at a time in, in, at a time in, in our history when there needs to be a revival and there needs to be a turning to God in every way of life. Let me tell you something. We need to become lion chasers. And I am in for bringing about a whole generation of lion chasers. And that's the only hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Be a lion chaser. Amen. Thank you.
One pair of hands form the mountains. One pair of hands form the sea. One pair of hands made the sun and the moon. Every bird, every flower, every tree. One pair of hands form the valleys, the ocean, the river, and the sand. Those hands are so strong, so when life goes wrong, put your faith into one pair of hands. One pair of hands healed the sick, one pair of hands raise the dead. One pair of hands calm the raging storm. And thousands of people were fed. One pair of hands said, I love you. And those hands were nailed to a tree. Those hands are so strong, so when life goes wrong, put your faith into one pair of hands. Those hands are so strong, so when life goes wrong, put your faith into one pair of hands. Put your faith into one pair of hands. One pair of hands.
Let us pray. Father God, like any athlete in training, one has to be able to endure to finish the race and win the crown. Yet this becomes very difficult as troubles and hard times test our faith and wear down our will to walk according to your word. Lord, give your saints the endurance and the stamina to persevere through the most difficult days. Helps us to rely not on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from your mouth. Lord, we know that, that if you are for us, that nobody, no one can be against us. And what can separate us from your love? Nothing. Not trouble, not hardship, not persecution, not hunger, not danger. Nothing can separate us from your love. Help us to remember that when we're faced with difficult experiences in life, guide us to be lion chasers, knowing that you are beside us and the victory is ours. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord Jesus Christ, the healer of all diseases and our great position of all times, we intercede for all those who are battling illnesses some taking treatments, others recovering from surgery, and still others in traumatic condition, not knowing the depth of their illness. Be especially with Mike Walls, who developed an infection, a pus pocket on his leg after taking his first chemotherapy treatment. We're thankful for this, for this is healing, and, and that he was well enough to return home and even to be with us in worship today. Continue to keep him physically and mentally strong as he plans to take MUO therapy treatments about three weeks from now. We pray that his immune system will be stronger. Bless and protect he and his wife and family members as they plan to travel some this coming week. Hugh Balls, who is recovering nicely from having a mass removed from his brain, we're thankful for the success of the surgery and his good health since surgery. We pray his radiation treatments along with the chemotherapy pills will provide an extra assurance that any cancerous cells left behind will be destroyed. Lord, we pray your healing power will work through these means and the antibiotics by IV that he is taking. We pray for a steady improvement day by day. Bless him and his wife Sue as they battle this disease together. Bonnie Cornelius, as she continues to recover from a knee replacement and some blood clot issues in her lungs. We're grateful that these were called in time so that they were small and had success in dissolving them. Give her better health and continue to give her strength to go through the knee therapy. Don Stywalt, who recently had issues with infection in his toes, foot, and leg that started from a callus on his foot we're thankful during his surgery that they were able to clean this infection out from these places, and we pray for his healing. Taylor Trexler, who will soon be having surgery this week on Friday on one of her ears, we pray for the success of this and for it to improve her hearing ability. Todd Goodman, who had double hernia surgery recently and just recently had to have one repaired a second time, we're thankful that he's now healing well from both of these surgeries. Thankful for his presence today in worship as well. And we pray that his progress may continue. Branson Lomax, uh, a one-year-old child who has experienced multiple health issues since birth. He had open heart surgery when he was six months old and recently had to have some more. Doctors recently closed up his chest. Heart valves are working better, kidney function is good. He seems to be more alert, he's off all of the sedation drips, but he may need to have surgery to put in a J-tube uh, that would bypass some of the stomach or some of his uh, intestines in order for him to get nourishment. Uh, we pray that you continue to give wisdom to his doctor's strength and courage to his parents. Help him with the rising fever that he has and some of the blood pressure issues that he had earlier this morning. Grant rest and healing to him through your healing power. 
We also pray for Huxley Drew as he continues wonderful good health. We're so thankful for that. His lungs have developed nicely. He's able to eat more solid foods, helping him to gain in weight and strength. We pray for others, Dr. Rob, Melvin Leslie, Dean Ingold, Shirley Cranford, Bobby Dry, Nick and Sarah Baez, Cindy Epley, Carolyn Trexler, Zeb and Emily Cook, Patty Carter, Gay Cornelius, Calvin Freeman, Shirley Goodman, Donna Petit, Donna Peeler Petit, Joe Hartso, Mary Vaughn, Frank Brenninger, Talca Abbott, Judy Harwood, Greg Pine, Chris Cranford, Jean and Diane Bonds, Mickey and Nancy Holsauser, Linda Kepley, Jean Leonard, Paula Lewis, Steve and Donna Michaels, Stella Stywalt, Tootie Robertson, Gabby Trexler, Richard and Bernice Janke, Kathy Lyerly, Jimmy Ketchy, Tim Shu, Reverend Buddy Hoffner, Emma Myers, Susan Myers, Brenda Rummage, Connor Cheeks, Margie Safford. And we pray and remember those families who have recently lost loved ones, the family members of Hoppy Hopkins, especially his wife Vivian, brother-in-law Ralph Udi, the family members of Jerry Craig, especially his wife Judy, and many others in the family, family members of Moses Deal, especially his son Israel, his brothers Randy and John and Jerry Stiller, and Amanda Basinger, who is Israel's mother, and we pray for Moses' dad, Terry Deal. We pray also for the family members of Eva Millsap. May these family members find comfort in knowing that their loved ones live eternally in the heavens with God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.